wouldn't some people drink socially, when for others, alcohol destroys their lives? Why can some people bounce back from adversity and others fall into depression? Why do some people love being around others, being on a stage, and others can't leave the house without crippling anxiety? These are the questions that drive my area of research. And because I'm a researcher, we're going to start by collecting some data together. I want you to raise and hold up your hand if you know someone who has been affected by a substance use or a mental health challenge. Could be a problem with alcohol or other drugs, with depression or anxiety, PTSD, eating disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar. Look around. It's all of us. And that's because one in four individuals over the age of 18 is affected with a psychiatric or a substance use disorder at some point in their life. One in four. I worked on a psychiatric unit as an undergrad. And I went into research because I saw the tremendous impact that these disorders had on individuals and on their families. And I believe that if I could discover what caused these disorders, it could make an impact that would go beyond the walls of any one psychiatric unit. Most of my research is in the area of alcohol problems. We now know that all of these kinds of disorders that I mentioned earlier, why do people become addicted or depressed or hear voices? Part of the answer to that lies in our genes. Some of us are born with a sequence of DNA that makes us more at risk for some of these outcomes. The reason I find it fascinating to study alcohol is that no one wakes up one morning to discover that overnight they had a sudden onset of alcoholism. So how do you go from a sequence of DNA you have at birth to becoming addicted? What does a risky genetic predisposition look like as an individual grows up? And importantly, is there anything that can be done? To find the answers to these questions, I work with researchers in Finland, studying kids as they move from adolescence to young adulthood. Because this is the period when most kids first try alcohol, and the at-risk subset start to develop problems. And the reason that we go to Finland is not because there's anything special about drinking in Finland, but because Finland has a central population register, which lists every individual born in the country. And it's a law that you have to keep your address updated with the government, so we know where to find them. And when we simply send a questionnaire in the mail, more than 90% of Finns send them back. imagine 90% of people in the United States doing anything. <laughs> but the Finns have a wonderful national health care system, and they know that when they participate in research, it comes back to benefit them. And so we're able to do research in ways that are simply not possible in the United States. So what are we learning in these studies? When we look at our early adolescent individuals, 12 to 14 years old. And we ask, what influences which of those kids have already started drinking? Is it in their genes or in their environments? It turns out that it's all environmental. Because for an early adolescent to start drinking, it requires access to alcohol. And it's factors in the home, and even more so in their schools and their neighborhoods that impact that. But then we follow those kids from 14 to 16 to 18, and we find that as they move 
from initial experimentation to more established, regular patterns of use, now their genes become important. And the effect of those environmental factors radically drops off. So the environment impacts when kids start drinking, but once they do, their genes take over. So wouldn't it be great if we knew who was most at risk before they ever took that first drink of alcohol? Well, we do. In another study that I work on, I work with researchers in England who enrolled all of the pregnant women in a geographical region over a two-year period. More than 14,000 families, and those kids have been studied since before they were born, and they're now in their mid-20s. And we wanted to know how early we could predict who was going to become one of those risky adolescent alcohol users. And so we gathered dozens of reports from the moms on their little kids before they were age five. And we found two groups of at-risk kids. The first were kids whose moms reported that they were having emotional and conduct problems since the time they were toddlers. These kids grow up to be the ones who are more likely to drink to cope and to deal with depression and anxiety. But there was a second group of at-risk kids, a bigger group, and these kids were completely different. These were kids whose moms reported that they were highly sociable little toddlers. These are the kids who are fun-seeking and highly impulsive. I have one of these. <laughs> these days, I spend my time trying to convince him not to jump from the top of that tree. Fast forward a decade, and I will be trying to convince him that beer bongs lead to nothing good. <laughs> and this brings us to what is perhaps the most important part. Our dispositions are not our destiny. Our environments can change how those dispositions play out. At Virginia Commonwealth University, we run a study called Spit for Science. And I'm going to tell you about the things that we're doing right here in the United States. But before I do, we're going to return to those Finnish kids. We asked them, how often do your parents know who you're with and what you're up to? And for the kids who reported very high levels of parental monitoring, their parents knew what they were up to. Environment was the most important thing, influencing how much those kids were drinking and smoking. But in the kids who reported very low levels of parental monitoring, their genes were the most important thing influencing their substance use. And it's not just parents. Our friends, our spouses, our neighborhoods all impact which parts of our predispositions get nurtured and which parts get kept in check. So let's talk about what we're doing right here in the United States. We run a project called Spit for Science. We ask our students at Virginia Commonwealth University to complete surveys, and yes, to spit into test tubes. It's a university-wide effort to understand how genetic predispositions come together with all these different parts of our environments to contribute to health and well-being across the critical transition to adulthood. And though I started by talking about how hard it is to re do research in the United States, we're not quite at the level of the Finns yet, but nearly 70% of our students voluntarily take part. Almost 10,000 students. 
And I think the tremendous success of this project is because Spit for Science isn't about researchers coming in to do a study. It's about how we can all play a part in discovering the causes of substance use and mental health challenges, and how together we can find the answers. And so we don't just go back into our labs and write up our findings for other scientists. We work with the practitioners who are on the front lines helping our students. And we collaborate with our arts and our mass communication students on how we can make research accessible and engaging. Because we want to give our research back to our students, back to our community. We believe that understanding dispositions, because we all have them, and what they mean and what they don't mean, can help individuals to make more informed, rewarding, and healthier choices about how to channel their own dispositions, how to support one another, and when to ask for help. And on the days when I worry what might become of this highly impulsive child of mine, I remember that he shares his genes with my father, a retired general, my brother, and his own father, all of whom are fighter pilots. <laughs> An alternate way to channel a sensation-seeking disposition. <laughs> so genetics is about so much more than monks and peas and Punnett squares. Our genomes influence our behavior starting very early in life. But our environments ultimately shape how those dispositions unfold. And that is the artful side of science. Thank you.